read verse four. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, thank you again today that we're grateful that we fully are known and loved by you. And Lord, we thank you today, Father, uh, for a love that is beyond comparison. Lord, in the fact that you would send your son to die for our sins. And Lord, we love you today. We praise you. We exalt you. The name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray, Lord, today I stand on this Father's Day. And Lord, I pray for your help. I pray for your guidance. I pray for your grace and your anointing as I stand here before these, your people. I pray you'd take the things that you placed upon my heart. May I express them in a way, in a fashion you'd be pleased with today. And Lord, I pray today, Lord, that you'd speak to hearts and lives, encourage us and exhort us and help us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the Father is to be uh, today. Interesting as I begin to prepare for this message uh, this morning. Uh, there'll be 76.1% of people in America who will celebrate, celebrate Father's Day. While this past Mother's Day, that over 84.5% celebrated their mother. And I thought, why the drastic difference? I believe there's a few reasons probably, but uh, some fathers live in the same home, but are absent when it comes to their children's lives. On the other hand, I believe there are some fathers who are absent because they have no desire to live in the home whatsoever and fulfill their role as a father. And we heard some of those statistics in Sunday school this morning. What a sad thing that is. Uh, somebody said that too many parents are guilty of raising their kids uh, like fish in a fish tank. They buy a tank, they fill it with water, and they dump some fish in it. They sprinkle some fish food on top and sit back and watch them feed. Well, what's the application of that? There are seven ways to be guilty of fish tank parenting. Number one, give your child everything they ask for or demand. <laughs> Number two, don't make them earn anything. Number three, don't monitor their TV, their music, their video game, or their social media, media activities whatsoever. Number four, Fail to provide them with spiritual training or instruction whatsoever. Number five, don't allow them to suffer the consequences of their mistakes. Number six, fight their battles for them, always assuming that they are the victim. It's always the teacher's fault, the principal's fault, or somebody else's fault in their life. And number seven, neglect to pray for them. And then I also found this as I... Uh, the top 10 things you'll never hear a dad say. I sort of like these. Well, but how about that? I'm lost. <laughs> Looks like we'll have to stop and get directions. <laughs> Been there, guys? Yep, I was there yesterday, actually. I got lost trying to find a baseball field. And I was arguing with myself because Renee wasn't in the car. And I said, no, this is the right way. And I haven't realized, no, that's the way you go to Pageland. It's not the way that you go to Waysboro. But uh, when you get old, you'll understand that, young folk. All right. Number nine, you know, Pumpkin, now that you're 13, you'll be ready for unchaperoned car dates. Won't that be fun? Number eight, uh, I noticed that all your friends have a certain hostile attitude. I like that. <laughs> Number seven, here's a credit card and the keys to my new car. Just go have fun, go crazy. Number six, what do you mean you want to play football? Is figure skating not good enough for you, son? <laughs> Number five, your mother and I are going away for the weekend. You might want to consider throwing a good party. Number four, well, I don't know what's wrong with your car. Probably one of those doohickey thingies, you know, that makes it run or something. Just have it towed to the mechanic and pay whatever he asks. No questions asked. Number three. No son of mine's going to live under this roof wire without an earring. Now, you quit your belly aching and let's go to the mall and get your ear pierced. Number two, what do, what do, want to go, what do you want to do? What do you want to go and get a job for? I make plenty of money for you just to spend and have fun and live life to its fullest. And number one thing you'll never hear a dad say 
uh, in this little article was, what do you want for Father's Day? His reply, oh, don't worry about that. It's no big deal, just another day. Actually, they might say this, but they really don't mean it. <laughs> okay. uh, well, what is the Father? The Father's to be. It's not about all those things. Uh, the Father, first of all, as we journey through Scripture just a moment, is to be a teacher. He's to be a teacher. The number one priority of a father, first of all, is he's to give instructions. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8 and verse 9 says, My son, hear the instruction of, the, my, of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. In other words, why? Why is he to give instruction? The simple reason is the child who learns early to bow to parental authority will learn respect for authority. Now don't miss that because that's very important. That's exactly what Solomon said here in the book of Proverbs. The child who learns early to bow to parental authority will learn respect for authority. Solomon learned respect for his dad early and he kept that respect for his dad. Let me just say this as I think about giving instruction. <laughs> it's not the responsibility of this community. It's not the responsibility of this church. It's not the responsibility of our school system. It's not the responsibility of our country to raise our children. It's your responsibility and my responsibility as a parent and a grandparent to raise our children. And we can't put that off on somebody else. And a lot of people have the, the misconception that if they send their child here uh, to this school or that school, they're going to get the principles they need. No, 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 no. That's just not scriptural. It's our responsibility in the foundation of the home for the husband, the father and the mother, uh, the husband and the wife, uh, to raise those children. Parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, it's our responsibility to raise our children. Nobody else's. We've got a great misconception today to that. Uh, he, the Father is the primary source. He's to give instruction. Uh, why do you think they come to you and say, Dad, how do I do this and how do I do that? And then if they can't get a good answer and you don't know, you know where they go, they go to their mother. Why? Because they, know, realize, when it, they realize when it comes down to it, she's probably going to be right in here. Amen? Thank you, ladies. At least you all say amen. He's to give instruction. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us he's, knowing, he's to give direction. Listen to what he said in that particular scripture in Proverbs 22. Uh, he is to give not only instruction but direction. Uh, in Proverbs, Solomon writes there again in verse 6, he says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Now folks, that, that's not a promise. Uh, he, he's, ma he's making an open objection here. He's stating a principle that will all probability work, okay? Uh, it, that word train up is the interesting thought that we'll look at in this direction. That's what he's speaking of here. He's speaking of direction. Train up. That word train up, it means to hedge in. It pictures cattle being herded into a, a pen. In other words, uh, the path is fenced in, so he has only one way to go. You say, well, preacher, that's awful narrow-minded. Yes, it is, and that's what he's saying. He said, you keep that kid's mind and his desires focused on one thing, and that one thing is God, and as long as he's the center figure and he comes first in that boy or girl's life, the better off he's going to be down the road when he has to make decisions about life. He's to give direction. This word train, it means to cultivate a desire. Folks, listen, dads, moms, we need to cultivate a desire in our children's lives. Listen, uh, to live life, to, to serve God. It mean, it, the word means to, uh, to make a path. You realize every day that you're walking a path before your sons or your daughters, and you're going to, uh, hopefully, they're going to walk down that path. That path is directed in the right way toward God. The Lordship of Jesus Christ. You're laying forth a path for them to make a path. It, it, this word also, this term train up means to bend with the purpose of straightening. Wow. You know, just like your children, you're going to face some times in your life 
God had to bend us, and we're going to have to do some bending also toward God away from the things of the world. He's to give direction. He's to give, as a teacher, he's to give instruction. But he's also to give correction. Uh, The scripture I read for you in the book of Ephesians, he said, therefore, and you fathers, provoke not your children. The interesting thought here is that word provoke not your children to wrath, it literally means to nag. It means to, it means to tease them in a sense. It means to tell them one thing and you do something else. There, there's really, first of all, there's a necessary distinction here in the scripture. He, as he says, provoke not. I like the illustration that Brother Mike Stone used. I was reading some things from him uh, in preparation for the message. And he said, listen, there's something definitely wrong. If you don't make your child mad somewhere along the way, you're raising them. Uh, If you don't make them mad and cause them to run down the hall saying, I hate you. Life is miserable with you. I don't want to live here any longer. I think I'm going to move out. Uh, They slam the door hard as they can. If they do those, listen, if they don't do those things, you might not be doing your job as a parent. You know why? Because somewhere on the way, they're going to go against the grain. They're, not, they're going to back talk. They're not going to like what you have to say about the principles that you have in your home and the principles you have of raising them. There's a necessary distinction. Provoke not your children to wrath. In other words, don't tease them in a sense. Don't, don't nag, nag them and aggravate them. But let life have its course. Let them say what they need to say, but you can stay consistent and how you treat them. But then there's a negative demand in this same scripture. He says, you father, provoke not your children to wrath. You know there's three ways that we damage our children. First of all, with constant criticism. Constant criticism. If you're always criticizing your children, you know what they're going to do? It's going to make them bitter. You know, that's exactly what he's talking about, about not provoking your children to wrath. If you're constantly criticizing them for what they do wrong. Listen, every child is different. Some kids are A honor roll students. Some, if they're trying their hardest to make a C, that's okay. As long as they're giving it to them all. Don't ever compare the C student with an A student because God's made us all uniquely different. And by the way, my wife had to make a trip to the school one time over that and set some folks straight in a loving kind of way. Because the teacher kept saying, you're not what your sister is. You're not the student your sister was. And that's right. One of our children was not the student that their, her, his sister was. Amen? One of the things we do is constant criticism. It's never just call our kids stupid and dumb. I've actually heard teachers and parents call kids morons. Folks, that ought not even be in our vocabulary when it comes to raising our children. Constant criticism. You're fat, you're ugly, you're stupid, and on and on and on, whatever. Folks, that ought not be in our vocabulary when we're raising our children. We damage our children. There's more adults today that have scars today uh, of, their, of, parenthood, of their being raised by their parents because of constant criticism. Always feeling they're not good enough or they cannot achieve because they were always downgraded because of who they were and what they did. And some of you, matter of fact, probably sit right here in this church this morning and you still had not got over it. And then I think the second way that we damage our children is hypocritical lives. We need more than just Sunday Christians, folks. Our life during the week ought to match our life on Sunday. And our kids know when they don't. Amen? They know when we're different on Sunday or when we run across somebody in church than when we don't. Larry Fowler, I quote, said this. He said, the highest, risk young per- young, the highest risk for a young person is not the one from a non-believing home, but rather the one from a, from a hypocritical Christian home. Wow. Number three, we need to avoid expect- expectation. Living your dreams through your children. That can be very dangerous. 
uh, expectant expectations, expecting them to be something you weren't, or expecting them to achieve in an area where you didn't, expecting them to be live out, live your life out for you because of failure, because maybe you didn't uh, that you didn't pursue what you wanted to as a child or a young person. Expect the expectations, and then fourthly, he's to give affection. He's to give affection. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, three different times, three different times, Paul writes and he says, Husbands, love your wives. Now, he didn't say that to the wives. He said for the wives to submit to their husbands, to show respect, not to be of lesser or equal value. That's not what he's speaking of. He tells the fathers in this text to love your wives. Three times he says, love your wives. You don't know why he said that? Your children need to know you love their mama. Amen? That's why he said that. We just don't get it sometimes. Listen, a child needs to know that their father loves their mother and they feel secure in the relationship between the husband and the wife or the mother and the father. Husbands love your wives. It means to give affection. So many times we're not raised as men to show affection too much. The greatest thing you could do is to show your children that you love your wife and you respect your wife and you lift her up and you're, you're, she is somebody in the home and in your relationship, marital relationship. Well, secondly, the father's to be a disciplinarian. Proverbs 13 verse 24 says, Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. <laughs> Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. We've got a lot of misconceptions about discipline. Uh, discipline doesn't mean that you beat somebody. But he gives us the idea of what discipline really is in verse 4 of Ephesians 6. And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. There's a lot said in that one sentence. But bring them up. First of all, uh, the father as a discipline, disciplinarian is to bring them up. The ultimate goal, ladies and gentlemen, is not to raise children but to raise Christians. That's what he's saying here. It's not to raise children, it's to raise Christians. Bring them up. Uh, bring them up. In other words, take them from here to there. Uh, if you bring something up, you have to lift up. You have to get underneath and you have to support and you have to put effort toward and you have to raise up. And that ought to be our goal as parents. We ought to want and desire for our children, listen, fathers, for our children to succeed and, and, and to succeed with the, in the relationship to Christ and the church and in the world. Let me just give you some things right here that's going to get sort of nitty-gritty, okay? Listen to this statement. You cannot take your children to a level that you aren't yourself. Don't you expect them not to curse if you curse. Don't you expect them not to drink alcohol if you drink alcohol. Don't expect them to do things opposite of what you're doing. You, your responsibility, dads, moms, is to set a standard. You can't take your children to a level you aren't yourself. And by the way, a pastor can't take a church to a level he's not himself. Secondly, now these three are going to, these, I, I borrowed these three, and I'm going to give credit where credit's due. I love Mike Stone, a great, great expositor. And he left me with three truths. I, had, I, I soaked on them, and I, I said, that I've got to share these. So he gets credit for these, okay? But let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Speaking to dads, it's thinking about bringing them up. Number one, you cannot teach what you do not know. You cannot teach what you do not know. If you don't know Jesus, it's going to be hard for you to teach them about Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, it's going to be hard for you to teach them about a relationship with Christ. Number two, you cannot lead where you're not going yourself. You can't lead where you aren't going yourself. And number three, you cannot share what you do not have. Now, folks, that's three powerful statements, I promise you.
If you'll let them soak in and absorb for just a moment, dads. You cannot teach what you do not know. You cannot lead where you're not going yourself. And you cannot share what you do not have. Secondly, we find in this text, in the book of, he says that we're to bring them up. But secondly, he says in the latter part of the verse, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We're to nurture them, okay? Now, he's not talking about petting them and pampering them. That's not what he's talking about. Most moms do a good job of that, okay? That's their role. They, it's different. they minister just a little different to children than men do. But what he's saying here is he's using the term in this nurture uh, and admonition. He's, saying, he's speaking here of training and admonition. It, it, it speaks really of, of proper levels of discipline. He literally is saying to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Not Reader's Digest, not Time Magazine, but the Word of God. Uh, in the Lord, instruct them by the Lord, the Word of God. It's our standard. Uh, it's our principle. But he says in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it speaks again, as I've said, of proper levels of discipline. You know, what works for a three-year-old is not going to work for a 13-year-old, folks. That's what he's talking about. A three-year-old is going to be disciplined totally different. You can send that three-year-old to timeout. You can make him go to the corner or her. Uh, you, can, you can do whatever you need to do. By the time they get to, to 13 and 14 and beyond, it's a little different. You have to, at 16, you've got to take away the car keys. You've got to take away the iPad. You've got to take away the cell phone. And by the way, if you've got a three-year-old that's got his own cell phone, you've got a problem anyhow. Amen. I'll just camp out right there just a minute. What he's talking about is there has to be nurture. There has to be discipline and instruction based on the level or the capacity of that child. There's some things that will work and some things that won't, but you have to do the discipline and measure the discipline by the age of the child and maturity of the child. And they're all different. Now, let me just throw this in right here when we talk about this discipline and instruction I, one of my children recently was taking a course to further their education and I had to, was in a psychology class and uh, uh, this came up and here's what was said parenting classes in this generation are teaching parents that they shouldn't tell their children what to do or not to do you should ask them what they want to do and let them make their own choice Example, you should not make them say thank you or excuse me or I'm sorry. You ask them if they would like to say thank you. Or you ask them if they would like to say excuse me. You ask them if they would like to say I'm sorry. You know what the Greek is for that? It's baloney. Amen? Baloney. They need to be taught to say, excuse me. They need to be taught to say, I'm sorry. They need to be taught to say, thank you. Amen? Amen. It's not an option in our house. Amen? Amen. We start very young. And folks, we're in a world where we get these erroneous ideas of this, that foolishness. But that's much of what's wrong with our culture. Because it raises children to think that you owe them something. And it creates and develops pride and arrogance and no respect for authority. And it starts with the mom and the dad and it trickles right on down to the teacher, the principal, uh, the, and all the law officers and everybody else that, you, that are servants to the people of America. Thirdly, he says the father is to be a provider. <laughs> He's to be a provider. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. He says, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Wow. An infidel? A person that, listen, that's not a provider for his home. He's worse. That word infidel means he's an unbeliever or a lost person. He's no better off saying he's a Christian than, than the, a lost person or an unbeliever is. He says that 
We're to, the Father is to be a provider. He's to be a protector of the home. He's to be a provider. He's to provide for his own, his own wife, his own children. Especially if he says he's a Christian. We can understand people who aren't saved, non-Christians, not caring. But we're to be at a higher standard. Amen? We have a responsibility, dads, fathers, to be a provider. I thank God as I stand before you today, I'm glad my father, if there's anything he taught me, he taught me that you work for what you get. You work and you labor and you work. You work and I was built and raised with a strong work ethic. And I'm not ashamed of that and I don't mind that because it taught me something about life and it taught me something about people who are working, making this world go around. And folks, we've lost that concept today. We've raised a generation that just wants to get by and get a handout from everybody else. If you're here today and you're dad and I don't apologize or back up one bit, you ought to work. If you're able, physically able, mentally able to provide for your family and make sure they have their needs. Amen. Not their wants. That comes extra, but their needs. The fathers will be a provider. And fourthly, the fathers to be a pattern. In that same context, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, 16. He pinned down something here that's very interesting in chapter 1, verse 16. He said, How be it for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Listen, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. I'm glad today for some of the patterns that I've had in my life. I'm so proud today and very fortunate to been around some men in my life, some uncles who were a pattern to me. Some weren't so good of a pattern. <laughs> but I'm grateful for the men that were a pattern to me, taught me something about serving God. I'm grateful for the older pastors who were a pattern for me. I Think about some of the guys that I've told you many, many times about different guys that I met when I came to Stanley County and Brother Howard Benoy and Yates Brooks and Farrell Shimpock and Matt Kick and some of those guys. There'd been a lot of Monday mornings I'd have quit and went back to the house to Caldwell County if it hadn't been for them guys. And my dear friend, Brother Otis, closer to me, Brother Ray Moon, and a lot of these guys, they, they, listen, I sat under them and watched their lives and listened to them. And Brother Otis, my best friend, he's more of a dad to me than my dad was. And I thank God for them. I thank God for the patterns that they left for me. Some of you men today, you may not realize that, but you're being a pattern to somebody else in your family, at your workplace, in your church. If there's anything I would, wouldn't want to do, just stand before the Lord one day. And the Lord say, son, you dropped the ball. You weren't the pattern as you ought to be as a pastor. I don't know about you. My dad made a lot of mistakes. Some of the patterns he gave to me, I could not follow. But there's some of them that I did. And I'm grateful for that. But let me challenge you today, men, dads, Everybody in here, really, make sure you're doing what you can to be the pattern that you ought to be for your children and for your grandchildren, your, for your family, for your friends. Because there's not a whole lot anymore pointing people to Jesus. But you are, whether you realize it or not, in your best and your worst of moments. Be the pattern that God's called you to be as a dad, guys. You'll never regret it. Let me close to say, I'll be the first to tell you, it's not an easy task being a biblical father. We've got a lot of work to do when it comes to being in the pattern of a husband and the father that our wives and our children need, but we can't quit. We've got to continue to pray and to labor and to do those things we know to do. 
my goal today and my challenge to you today is I hope you'll accept is to teach your children discipline your children provide for your children be a pattern for your children now this is my life statement don't let someone else take the opportunity God has given you fathers to be a father don't let somebody else take the opportunity God's given you to be the father that you ought to be. This morning there may be somebody here in this church that's not a Christian, you've never accepted Christ. What a loving father that we have that sent his son to die on a cross just because simply he loved you. He loved you. And all he wants you to do is give your heart and life to him and love him back. Can you go back to a time and place in your life where you've done that? If not, you need to today on this Father's Day. Just simply come and say, Lord, Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for my sin. I, I want to accept him as my Savior. Secondly, there's some of you this morning here, you're, you're already a Christian. You're a dad. But, but what kind of path are you, are you leading for your children? What are you teaching them? Are, are, are you following through with proper discipline? Are you providing for them? Are you the pattern that they're going to look to when they get out of life and have to make decisions, whether to go this way or to go that way? Are they going to look at the pattern that you've left for them to make good decisions? Maybe there's some today that just come and say, man, I sure appreciate my father for being the pattern that it was for me. Maybe some of us need to come today on this, during this invitation and say, Lord, help me to be the pattern that I need to be for my, for my children, for my grandchildren, for those people around me that I know that I have contact and impact with. I'm going to have Danny to come and play this morning for our invitation. As we stand to our feet this morning, we've seen the Father that He wants us to be, and that's all that really matters. Our heads about and eyes closed. A lot of the work that we have to do, folks, men, to be the pattern of a husband, the father that our wives and our children need starts right here. It starts on our knees here before a holy God. Maybe you need to make a trip this morning and say, Father, just help me to be the father that I need to be. Help me to continue to grow in your grace and knowledge and be the pattern for my children and my grandchildren that I need to be and for others as well. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenges we find, Lord, on this Father's Day uh, message, Lord, today, individually and collectively. Speak through our hearts. Help us to listen to the voice of God now in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.